Laverne Baker, Money Blues. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermin Sheikh. We turn now to the movement to challenge corporate personhood, the notion that corporations have equal rights to individuals. On Tuesday, Independent Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont and Democratic Congressman Ted Deutsch of Florida introduced the Democracy is for People Amendment, which seeks to overturn the Supreme Court's 2010 landmark Citizens United case. In a 5-4 to four vote, the court ruled corporations have First Amendment rights and that the government cannot impose restrictions on their political speech. Speech. This cleared the way for corporations and other special interest groups to spend unlimited amounts of money on elections. The proposed amendment states that only natural persons can financially influence the outcome of public elections. If enacted, the amendment would completely prohibit for profit corporations, non profit organizations, and unions from making expenditures in elections. Congressman Deutsch said in a statement, quote, The democracy is for people amendment will stop corporations and their front groups from using their profits and dark money donations to influence our elections while reaffirming the right of the American people to elections that are fair and representatives that are accountable. Meanwhile, state legislatures of North Carolina, West Virginia, New Hampshire have introduced resolutions condemning Citizens United. All three resolutions call on Congress to pass a constitutional amendment to reverse the 2010 decision and limiting money in politics. However, not all critics of the Citizens United ruling believe the amendment movement is a fruitful endeavor. Mark Schmidt wrote in The New Republic that the amendment movement, quote, undermines progress on other solutions, including public financing improvements and corporate governance to give shareholders more say in political contributions, disclosure improvements, and better enforcement of existing laws by both Federal Election Commission and the Internal Revenue Service." Quote. Well, for more, we're hosting a debate with two critics of Citizens United on opposite ends of the amendment issue. In Washington, Mark Schmitz with us, the senior fellow at the Roosevelt Institute and former editor of The American Prospect. Here in New York, we're joined by John Boniface, a constitutional attorney, co-founder and director of Free Speech for People. He's helped lead the amendment efforts. Mark and John, we welcome you both to Democracy Thank you for Now. Me. Um, well, why don't we start with John? Lay out why it is you're pushing this amendment and where it stands in the country right now. Sure. Well, you know, Amy, when we launched this campaign the day of the Citizens United ruling, there were plenty of skeptics who thought it couldn't be built. This movement wouldn't have any staying power. It was too difficult. And I think we've proven with our allies in the field, Common Cause, Public Citizen, People for the American Way, Move to Amend, and many others, that those skeptics are now wrong. Eleven states are on record calling for a constitutional amendment, 500-plus cities and towns across the country. Members of Congress, business leaders, religious leaders, and the President of the United States have all come out in support of this. And we need this amendment because the only way to overturn a United States Supreme Court ruling is through a constitutional amendment or waiting for a new majority of the Supreme Court to do so. And the people understand in this country that the Supreme Court is wrong on this basic question. Corporations are not people. They do not breathe. They do not think. They do not have a conscience. They're artificial entities that we create, and people should govern over corporations, not the other way around. And so the constitutional amendment says exactly what? Well, there are various proposals out there, but there are two major problems that the constitutional amendment needs to address. First, it needs to address the point that Congress and the states shall have the authority to limit overall campaign spending and campaign contributions. This dates back to a 1976 ruling, Buckley v. Vallejo, which equated money with speech and set forth this system of unlimited campaign spending we have today. The other problem is the problem of corporations being treated as people under the Constitution. The these corporations argue uh, in court cases after court cases that they, in fact, have the rights of people, natural persons, and those arguments are being used to strike down public interest laws protecting our environment, our health care, consumer rights, civil rights, and now our elections. And we need to address both problems via these amendment bills. So, Mark Schmidt, can you explain why it is that you're opposed to efforts uh, at a constitutional amendment? Uh, sure, and I'm and I'm glad to be here. I I've always viewed I I'm not surprised that the constitutional amendment is, is has caught on. I was not a I didn't I wasn't the kind of skeptic that that John describes. I think it's easy to to describe. I think it's easy to get get people to sign a petition for it because uh, it sounds very clear cut. I view it as a real distraction from some real progress that we can make on money in politics because 
while you can build a movement around these these vari yeah, there are like 17 different versions of the amendment, uh, while you can build a movement around this concept, the message it sends is we can't do anything until we have a constitutional amendment, and under the current circumstances, we can't do anything until we have a constitutional amendment is exactly the same as saying we can't do anything. And so I think that's just sending the wrong signal uh, to people and overlooking the tremendous progress that's actually being made, which John knows because he was there at the birth of it, really, on public financing that offsets the role of, of big money from individuals and big money from corporations, which really are not dramatically different, uh, whether Sheldon Adelson writes money as an individual or through his corporate entity. It really doesn't matter all that much, but we can offset that money with good public financing, such as in New York City, Arizona, uh, Connecticut. These systems are popular, they're resilient, the they withstand cha legal challenges, and that's really where, uh, you know, the energy ought to be focused at this point. But why can't, Mark Schmidt, why can't these efforts take place in conjunction with an effort to push through the constitutional amendment? Well, as long as, you know, to the extent that you're, that you're making clear that you don't need the constitutional amendment to do, to, to, to make some progress, uh, you know, it's not, it's not the worst thing in the world. A lot of it depends on which amendment it is. I, I don't have a problem with an amendment that overturns Buckley uh, v. Vallejo uh, and, and says that we can, we can limit overall spending on a campaign as well as as contributions the corporate personhood issue is a lot more complicated I mean a simple simple example of it is uh, John works for uh, free an organization called free speech for the people incorporated it's a corporation uh, corporations are how we organize everything in in American society it's how you know political parties are incorporated it's really the form of organization we use and at some level you know I work for a corporation uh, many of these corporations are actually Organized for the purpose of political speech. So, in a sense, so I think it's a pretty big leap, uh, and 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 goes way beyond what actually happened in Citizens United, in which corporate personhood is a very tangential concept to Citizens United. So, in a sense, John, you work for the man because if a corporation is a person <laughs> and you work for a corporation, well, I guess for the man or the woman. But well, what's what do you think is wrong with what Mark's saying that these other efforts would be more productive? Well, first, let me say that there's a lot that Mark and I agree on. I mean, public funding of elections is a critical reform, and I couldn't agree more that that needs to happen as well. Where we may disagree is the idea that somehow these are not complementary efforts. In fact, a constitutional amendment campaign, which returns the country to the first principal question of what we are as a nation, is it we the people or we the corporations, can help propel these other kinds of important reforms. So I am a longstanding advocate for public funding elections. I believe in it. But the Citizens United ruling has set us on a course which allows these artificial entities to to now spend unlimited amounts of corporate dollars into our elections, undermining any public funding system. We need both efforts to go forward. As for the point that Free Speech for People, Inc., uh, is a corporation that somehow should have free speech rights, it's just anth antithetical to what the framers intended, what our Constitution is about. I'm a natural person, you're a natural person, Nermeen's a natural person, Mark's a natural person, but these corporate entities are not natural persons. Why we are, are they bestowed with this? Well, this is a artificial creation, really, of corporate America over the past 30 years in the most recent era to undermine the First Amendment and the Constitution, the argument being made that these entities need to have free speech rights alongside natural persons. But, you know, the point here is that the members of Free Speech for People Incorporated, the supporters, all have constitutional rights. Nothing's going to be changed by these constitutional amendments on that point. What will be changed is restoring democracy to the people, making clear that we govern over corporations, not the other way around. Well, John, can you also respond to what Mark Schmidt said about there being something like 17 versions of this amendment? Well, look, we're at an early stage in the drafting of this amendment language. The key thing that has to be done here is to build a broad grassroots movement for this amendment. And we're more than a quarter of the way there, with over 11 states on record. It takes 38 states to ratify, and now many members of Congress coming forward. We support Congressman McGovern's amendment bills that he's introduced, the People's Rights Amendment, H.J. Res 21, and the amendment
amendment, what we call the Political Equality Amendment, H.J. Res. 20, which would deal with these two basic problems, unlimited campaign spending and the problem of fabricated doctrine of corporate constitutional rights. But we're not at the point now where we have to all come together behind one specific uh, about, uh, language. What we really need to do here is build this broad movement, which is being built. And as you said in the opening, there are many other states that, where these resolutions are advancing. Again, this propels other reforms, including public funding of elections, transparency, shareholder approval. We need this vibrant democracy movement if we're going to protect the promise of American self-government of form by the people. In unveiling his uh, Democracy is for People Amendment, um, Florida Democratic Congressman Ted Deutsch said, quote, any constitutional amendment that simply gives Congress the option of regulating campaign finance fails to immediately achieve what the American people want, and that is a complete reversal of Citizens United and other Supreme Court decisions that have allowed corporations and the wealthy few to drown out the voices of everyday voters. John Boniface. I think it's an important new introduction, another amendment bill that needs to be uh, put forward and debated in the Congress. But again, we really have to build this uh, from the states, and, and that's, the, that's the work that's happening today. Uh, Mark Schmidt, can you also respond to the comments that uh, uh, Florida uh, Congressman uh, Ted Deutsch made, and also elaborate a little on what kind of uh, campaign finance reform you think is plausible and should be pursued? Sure. I, I mean, I, I think, you know, Citizens United was wrongly decided. It went way beyond even the question that was that was uh, be, before the court, uh, without even without even requiring any of the issues related to, to corporate personhood. I, I think we've we've made a lot of progress in this. We, we're really undergoing a grand experiment with how how much we can do with public financing of elections, and I think we're beginning to find that uh, those systems those systems that either provide a fixed amount of money to candidates who, who agree to forego uh, most private money or that match small contributions, like New York's uh uh, system of a six to one match, or the system in Minnesota that's been defunded, but while it was there, was a was a tax credit. So essentially, you got a a, a fully refundable tax credit. So essentially, you got like a free fifty dollars every every citizen to contribute to campaigns. That those can really help candidates get to the point of being heard without uh, without uh, re re turning to big money and get them enough to n that they're not necessarily shot down by big money. So that has to be, I think, I think the biggest priority. And I don't think that. You you know, I, I don't want to send any signal that you require a full reversal of Citizens United uh, in order to make progress on those grounds, because you really, uh, you really, really don't. And there, and there are uh, at least two or three bills in Congress such as Senator John Sarbanes' Grassroots Democracy Act that, that can begin to, to move in this direction. I would hope, I would hope we'd have a, a, a change in the tide at the court. Uh, you know, there, there are five members in that, in that uh, Citizens United majority. I think two of them are in their 70s, one of them in, the, in his 60s. Uh, you know, the, the, the odds are not bad that, that, that President Obama or the next Democratic president will have an opportunity to remake that majority, the, the, you know, the four who are in the Citizens United minority uh, hold it very strongly. Those four don't, you know, they, they, if their position if their position prevail, you certainly don't need a constitutional amendment to, to to do that. So I think that I think that there's reason to hope that the Supreme Court could shift without this very very actually quite sweeping amendment. That I, I don't really know what happens after. Uh, after a full corporate, you know, corporations aren't people amendment. I don't know what happens to the rights of organized groups like Free Speech, uh, Speech for People Incorporated. John uh, Boniface. After that. I think it's a, 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 yeah. a weird area. Well, the, the rights are protected uh, by the uh, Constitution as they always have been. The individual rights is what's at stake here, not the co corporate rights that are as a fabrication. But let me just address the point about movement on the court. You know, there's a good historical example of how a constitutional amendment can help move a court. The poll tax, which, as we know, was a fee charged to voters in order to vote, was upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1937 and again in 1951. And then in the heat of the civil rights movement came Annie Harper, a poor Virginia voter, and other Virginia voters with her, challenging the, the poll tax for the third time, Virginia v. Uh, Harper v. Virginia Board of Elections. By the time they got to the Supreme Court in 1966, the poll tax amendment, the 24th 
Amendment to the Constitution had been enacted in 1964, barring poll taxes in federal elections. That case dealing with poll taxes in state elections got before the Supreme Court two years later, and the Supreme Court finally reversed those prior two rulings. So amendment campaigns and amendment movements are critical for pushing back in the courts as well. I agree we should push back in the courts, but I don't think we need to do any one of these things in isolation. They all go together. And explain how your organizing is going around the country, how you organize for a constitutional amendment. I mean, the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment, went down, uh, though there was tremendous momentum for it at a time. Yeah, well, first of all, the Equal Rights Amendment went down only because there was an artificial seven-year time restriction placed on getting it ratified. Thirty-five states ratified the ERA. Carolyn Maloney, Congresswoman from New York, has introduced repeatedly a bill to remove that time restriction, allow the remaining three states to ratify. We're not putting any seven-year time restriction on these amendment bills. We understand it can Who take more— the restriction, the well, time Congress. restriction? Congress, when they passed the amendment bill, put the restriction on the ERA. But the ERA very quickly got to 35 states ratifying, and then time ran out, again, on an artificial basis. Uh, but the way we're organizing this is, as other organizing movements have done, working with people at the grassroots level, our coalition partners, state-based partners, local uh, organizations, as well as elected officials, leaders in those communities, to pass resolutions at the local level, county level, state level, and really to generate the galvanizing kind of momentum that's needed to show Congress that they must act. We're not going to get there necessarily this year or the next year, but we believe that over the next several years there will be enough states on record showing Congress that they must act while all these other important efforts go forward uh, to reform and defend our democracy. Uh, Mark Schmidt, uh, your comments before we conclude? Well, sure. I mean, I think that I think the ERA, uh, the Equal Rights Amendment, is actually a wonderful example of how a constitutional constitutional amendment movement, even apart from actually ratifying the constitutional amendment, can kind of galvanize a whole range of efforts. And while that was proceeding, uh, you know, the women's rights movement, the feminist movement, was making enormous gains both in the workplace, state government, uh, state laws, federal laws, uh, and 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 the culture as a whole. With that as an organizing principle, and I think some. Something like, for example, a constitutional amendment on the right to guaranteeing the right to vote would be a similar uh, great organizing tool, and you could do a lot of things kind of in its wake uh, while while you waited for that right to be fully established. Those are those are what I call yes we can amendments. They really give you a lot of room underneath them to organize. The the, um, the various amendments here are for the most part uh, kind of no we can amendments. They kind of, they send the message you can't make the big gains that really matter matter until you've passed this constitutional amendment, exactly as uh, Congressman Deutsch uh, said, which really, which really isn't the case. So it's a, it's a, it's a very misleading message that these, that the, these 17 or whatever amendments send uh, that's quite different from ERA or, um, or, or poll tax. Or, John, or, or, that this or, could uh, hurt the cause? We're not hearing that message. The message we're hearing from people all around the country is they want to stand up to lift up the promise of American democracy, of government, of, for, and by the people. That's the message that's going across this country. Well, John Bonifacio, I want to thank you for being with us, Director of Free Speech for People, and Mark Schmidt, Senior Fellow at the Roosevelt Institute and former editor of The American Prospect. That does it for the show. If you'd like to read